Yeah, but you dropped out for about 10 seconds. Oh, okay. Well, well, we'll try this again. So what I'd like to start off with is the definition of safety glazing so that we're all on the same page. And it, as you can see, safety glazing from most of our um, standards that we're well aware of is a, a glass that protects humans from contact and impact. And it's, it's not to stop the glass from breaking. It's not to stop things like fall out and fall through. We're losing you, Julia. And stuff like that. It's to reduce the likelihood of cutting. Um, yes. Yeah, your audio Julia, is terrible. Julia, you keep dropping Hello? off. You keep dropping off. Okay. I, I don't know what else to do. Um, let me let me do this. Let me call in quickly on the phone. Uh, it might yeah. help. I'm going through the computer. So, uh, Sarah, do you know what the dial in number is quickly? I didn't print it out. Yeah, sure. It's 786 535 3211. Okay. The access code is 819 746 061 pound. Okay. Um, if you can hear me here, I am going to dial in. And it, hopefully it'll be a seamless transition. Um, all right, coming in. Sorry about this, guys. This is part of the guinea pig stuff, right? Tornado audio controls. Please enter your audio pin followed by the pound or half I just time. did. If you do not no, have eight pin, pound. Eight pound. Okay, I just. All right. So what I'm gonna. Is this better? Is this better? Is this better? Any better? Uh, oh. Turn off. Turn off your computer, Mike, because you're getting feedback. Got it. Any better? Yeah. Any better? All right. Julie, Julie, keep talking. I've muted your, your computer mic. Oh, good. Thank you, Sarah. Okay. So we'll get back to this and, uh, and where we are. So we'll get back to this and. Maybe. If you're not talking, maybe you should put it on mute so we don't get any feedback. It is on we mute. Don't get any no, I mean for everybody. Oh. And, uh, Sarah, any suggestions? We're we're hearing the feedback from um from everybody. Okay. Okay. So everybody needs to go on mute. Okay. Is everybody on mute? Is this sounding better so far? Okay. I hear um, Sarah, uh, Irma, you just asked me and everything is muted. Um. Okay, we'll give this a try. Um, everybody can hear me? Yes. Okay. Now we can. All right. So what I was saying is it's a reduction of, of cutting and piercing injuries. It's the basic definition of safety glazing. And, but it's not fire. It's not fallout. It's not an assessment of strength or anything like that. And a lot of times we try to lump all that stuff together. The other The other part that we have to recognize is that the Canadian standard and ANSI Z97 are really the mother documents for all safety glazing tests that have ever been implemented anywhere else in the world. So they do have a big cornerstone effect as to what um, what they're doing. Can I show you? 
show my screen please. I am showing my screen. Can you see my screen now, Sarah? Yes, thank you. <laughs> okay, sorry. Uh, so they do have a big cornerstone effect. Um, I'm getting messages from everybody and everything, nothing is different on my computer, so I'm not sure what, uh, all right, whatever. Um, we're seeing it. We're seeing it now. Okay, Julia. good. Thank you. So the background is, is there were injuries from glass doors when sliding glass doors and patio doors were first implemented. And that's what sparked the, um, the, the rig, big rash of having to do something for safety glazing materials because people were not used to having, um, having these big pieces of floor to ceiling glass and they were walking into them quite frankly. So in 1966, ANSI became a voluntary standard. And in 1970, um, both Canada and the U.S. passed some safety glazing regulations. And I have to thank these copies on the side for, uh, to John Kent and SGCC because he pulled these, these documents up. And you can see um, 1972, you started seeing the Consumer Product Safety Code coming into the investigative section of adopting this. And the other big thing was um, you had a celebrity, and many people won't remember who she is, but Della Reese, who just recently passed away, had a life-threatening uh, incident with, with glass. And that actually promoted uh, the awareness of glass safety. And um, she spent many, many months in the hospital recuperating, and because of her high-profile status at the time, it really did catapult the need for safety glazing forward. And you can watch her YouTube video um, on on the on uh, on that event. It's it's pretty moving. So when we look at the Canadian standards, there were updates that occurred. The very first publication was actually prior to the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission one, and it was in 1976. The CPSC in the U.S. was published in 1977. And um, this one was published <clears throat> late in the year 1975. And over the time, there were several revisions that occurred to it until they got to the 1990 version. And the 1990 version was fairly well harmonized with the 1984 version of the ANSI standard. They had uh, glass types of tempered and laminated. They had two categories of impact. They had incorporated boil tests for laminates and the center punch test for tempered glass. But after that, the Canadian standards actually halted. There was no activity between 2000, uh, 1990 and 2014. So what happened? Why did they feel that they needed to uh, update the standards? So there were several lawsuits involving uh, monolithic wired glass that occurred up in Canada, and many interests felt that they, they needed to push to have the standard updated. And they also noticed that a lot of the specifications were starting to carry the updated ANSI requirements, and certainly they wanted to have a national standard. So there were notices sent back and forth, and lo and behold, the Canadian Glass Committee was reestablished, and they started looking at the documents. Um, when you look at the objectives for the committee, it was to clearly define safety glass, which was a change to what they had in the earlier version. They had to update and address the technology of new products. Many of um, the products that they had in the earlier version, the 1990 version, um, were either not offered anymore or they weren't keeping up with the, with the new uh, renditions of either the plastics or films or anything like that. And their other objective was to harmonize as much as possible with this ANSI Z97, and that was because of trade and, and qualifications and everything else. So there were specific rules that it had to be developed under that were issued by um, the Canadian building practices and, and all of that. So once they got their objectives designed, they, the first meeting was in the spring of 2014, and they published the document in 2017. They did, in fact, acknowledge the assistance of the um, ANSI Z97 or the uh, Accredited Standards Committee because the Accredited Standards Committee offered them um, freedom from all copyright. And they said, take our standard and copy it. We just really want to have the two countries harmonized and make sure that we're, we're talking the same language when it comes to safety. 
So the committee, and I'll just put this up quickly, but you can see there were general interest categories, producer categories, regulatory, um, and user categories, and it was all monitored by um, the Canadian General Standards Board with Jennifer uh, Jimenez, and she was the one that coordinated everything. The chair for the committee was our own Marg Webb. Uh, she, um, she did a fantastic job herding the cats and making sure that uh, all the updates and everything were pulled together, and it was a very intensive number of years to pull this document uh, together and a lot of work from not only the people on the committee, but the people that they um, contacted and, and got references and whatnot from. So the standard adoption process, um, the Canadian General Standards Board establishes the standard. It's followed by the Standards Council of uh, Canada because they have very specific requirements of how a standard is developed. Once it is developed, the National Research Council of Canada, Canada which is like our ICC in the U.S., um, adopts it in the National uh, Building Code of Canada, and the provinces, the provinces consider it for adoption. So just an update of where this is, and is that it has been approved. There is one uh, task that is left, and that is surrounding what to do with their standard on wired glass. They expect it to be uh, formally put into the 2020 uh, Canadian Building Codes, but the provinces have the capability of adopting it earlier, and there, there has been some activity in that side. Um, the standard itself, what I tried to do is where I could is, is show you the difference between the 2017 on the, on the left and the uh, older version on the, on the right. You can see the title change itself is much more encompassing. It went from tempered or laminated safety glass to any safety glass. And so that was a big opening um, and a source of a lot of work for the Canadian group to, to have to deal with. Um, in general, things like the format and order of the sections change, the titles, the limits and tolerances were also modified. Uh, there are some small differences in that. It's not published as a dual language, which was a major step. It is only published in English. Um, references mostly the Canadian standards and ASTM standards. They did remove some things. Um, some of the specification part of the old standard has been removed. They had much more detail on the testing. And um, they do say that nominal thickness differences, so if you went from a three millimeter to a four millimeter to five millimeter glass um, or, or laminate construction of anything, those have to be tested, which it wasn't clear in the previous one. Everything else pretty much stays the same except the adoption of the weathering requirements, which mirrors the ANSI Z97 requirements. When you get into the scope, um, you can see the differences here between the 17 version and the 90 version. It broadens to glazing materials. It better defines what injury is. It um, takes into effect all building and architectural uses. It used to be a little more limited, and it clearly defines that it doesn't address certain aspects such as strength, fire rating, and whatnot. Uh, it also clearly points out that certain products are not in any way, shape, and form considered safety glazing materials. And those are anneal glass, heat strengthening glass, chemically strengthened glass, glass ceramics, and wired glass. And that's a, that was a major change for the standard. Um, terms and definitions, these are all the different things that are defined. I'm not certainly going to go through all of them, but uh, they do have certain uh, terms and definitions that are called out that may be slightly different than what we we know, but for the most part, they're fairly well harmonized. And then the product types that are covered, as I said, in the 1990 version, it was laminated and fully tempered glass only. In the 2017 version, it covers a broader range, laminate, tempered, organic coated glass, plastics, and mirror glazing. So those have been added to the, to the document. Um, the sizes have also have also changed, um, and this is a potential source for some confusion as we get moving on. But in the 1990 version, it was driven by size of glass, so less than 0.8 meters or greater than 
1.8 meters told you which category it was. Now it's similar to what is in ANSI, where there's a test um, size that allows you to call everything unlimited. And then if you test anything smaller than that, you have a limited designation. And so this no longer defines and this is a key, the sizes no longer define the categories in the Canadian standard. When you go to the classes and categories, this is where the exclamation point in the watch out is. In the old standard in 1990, cl uh, product classification A meant sheet glass and product classification B meant float glass. Well, over 90% of all glass now is, is uh, that we use in buildings is float glass. And so, <clears throat> they had a product classification and an impact category. Well, as you can see, the impact classification now is the A and B. And so caution needs to be had when you're looking at a Canadian specification to understand which one they are referring to. So uh, beware of the A and B, okay? Because now it refers to the drop height, not the product. Then the marking, uh, very limited marking requirements in the 90 version, a little bit more detail is required in the 2017 version. Basic stuff that it has been required through uh, the ANSI Z97 uh, for quite some time. And I believe that the majority of fabricators in Canada has have been putting a lot of these details on anyways. Uh, so. The changes for them is the size, the L or the U for limited and unlimited, the class A or B for the um, for the drop height, and then the place of fabrication and, and other, other information. So you can see a sample label there. Um, the one thing that they do that is a little bit different is there is a no work equals no compliance. So our CPSC documents allow us to have a certificate in some instances. Um, but here, there, if there isn't a mark on the glass, it is not compliant. So that is, um, that is part of what's, what's happening there. Um, the application of the mark, a couple things that are in the 2017 is laminated glass stock sheets are marked by the manufacturer of the stock sheet. Cut size laminates uh, are marked by the company producing the finished cut size panel. So for instance, if somebody is selling um, glass to uh, a, um, a distributor, and that distributor cuts the glass. That distributor is responsible for, law, for labeling the glass and therefore ensuring the tracking and all of the information um, that it is compliant. So the fabricators to mark the plastic glazing, there is an indoor only application uh, used today that wasn't in the other standards, but it has to be duly marked. And also anything with uh, asymmetry, um, such as the organic coated films, um, they have to mark glaze this side in, and it has to be in accordance with how the product was tested. So those are all some things that we are a little bit familiar with in the in the uh, lower lower states, uh, but uh, up up in Canada, this is all somewhat new to them. The test methods themselves, the nice part is it, it, the impact test is essentially the same. It's still the shot bag, uh, lead-filled shot bag, 45 kilograms, 100-pound bag that is, um, is rounded out and dropped from the various heights. The fragmentation test is the same as it was in the uh, 1990 version. They had actually adopted that prior uh, to the ANSI Z97 adoption of the fragmentation test. Mirrors are only impacted on the non-reinforced side, and now bent glass is added to the standard, so it talks about the uh, radius of curvature for the impacting and, uh, and how to go about that. Again, indoor applications uh, do require some aging and weathering. Um, if you do qualify your product for exterior, it is automatically uh, approved for interior applications. And there is thermal testing, albeit in a bake oven or in a boil tank for laminate and organic coated products. And there are weathering requirements, which are either natural exposure in southern Florida or uh, xenon uh, exposure in an accelerated chamber. And those are, those are required today. The tests themselves, this is the same chart that is in Z97. 
Uh, you can see for, based on the, the four different types of materials what is required. Since this is an impact test, every product is required to be impacted, so that's the top row. Then the other, uh, other testing is specific to the product types. And, and what is deemed to be uh, appropriate test to check for uh, safety and safe breakage. So you can see that the plastics do a hardness and modulus. Um, the weathering is, is for any materials that have any type of polymer and, and so on. Okay. The specific, the specimen requirements are the same as they were. You test four units. Um, Mirror with backing, you only have to impact the non-reinforced side. Bent glass, there's a simple arc that is uh, allowed to, so that you don't have to test every single arc. There's three samples tested for thermal, which is the same. Nothing has changed. So that would be the bake and boil. And the weathering does change based on the products because of the end test at, after the weathering has, has occurred. So you have to reference the standard to understand those. And then the plastics, plastics testing. So there really isn't a lot of change in the specimen requirements to the Canadian standard, with the exception of the weathering samples. Okay. The impact is also the same. There is a temperature conditioning requirement that wasn't there before. Um, the bag does, it specifically says the bag needs to be rotated in between each impact. You have to pummel the bag to the original shape. Uh, prior to testing, and it could happen to uh, need to be pummeled into shape with a, with a mallet in between each test if it's a very uh, hard material and the bag does deform. And then all the rest of the, um, the information is, is essentially the same. So there isn't a change to uh, having to get new test equipment or anything like that. The center punch fragmentation test also has not really changed. Um, there are a couple, if you look, there's uh, some minor things with the uh, mass and of unbroken specimens and stuff like that, but it's all, it's all the same. You punch the, um, you, you punch the edge, the location of the punch is somewhat different. It used to be 15 millimeters at the midpoint, now it's within um, 25 millimeters of the midpoint, and then there's some exclusion areas that you don't count. For, for tempered glass that were not necessarily defined in the 1990 version. The thermal test is new, um, at least the, the bake part of it. Uh, the, the boil test is a two hours at 100 degrees C. The bake test is 16 hours at 100 degrees C. Um, you recondition it at to the temperature range prior to rating and you evaluate anything that occurs that is outside of the 12 millimeters from the edge. And that's very consistent with, um, with obviously Z97. And you can see the changes. The 90 version had boil test only. You removed it um, and then rated it um, at, various, at various times. Essentially, as soon as you could handle the glass, you could, you could rate it. And the uh, evaluation area from the edge was a little bit smaller. Uh, the weathering at the exterior, this is a part that has changed a bit. Um, this is all incorporated. It was not in the 1990 version. So you, do, you can do, as I said, South Florida or Accelerated. You do an assessment on the products for uh, polymer degradation. And, and some qualification things are that thicker product qualifies, uh, thin pro product qualifies thicker product, and clear products qualify colored products. So that is, that is in there as well. Uh, indoor applications are essentially the same exact weathering requirements, but through a filter that stimulates the sunlight coming in through the glass before it hits the product. So it's got a, a second level of filtering, if you will. And it has to pass those, those requirements and has the same qualifications. Weathering of inserts. So inserts are anything that you may put into a laminate that uh, it could be rice paper, it could be grass, it could be leaves or pictures or anything like that. Uh, they wanted to be sure that since that is a, an option that is being incorporated, that they had some language as to what could be tested and what wouldn't be. 
essentially, as long as the, um, the product that is encapsulating that material is the same thickness as something that has already been tested, you do not have to retest. If you change that thickness um, or, or do something other than that, then the weathering needs to be redone, as does the impact test. So that's it. And there's a page that um, you will get uh, that shows all the different variations of that, but we don't have time to go into that today. The other part is the interpretation of results. It's broken down into four types. Type one is that fragments are contained after the breakage. Type two is the glass may um, break safely, but it does not necessarily stay in the frame. Type three is a plastic type break where the whole panel may come out, but it may stay intact. And type four is there is no break. Now for tempered glass, if you do get a type four break, you do have to do the center punch um, fragmentation to ensure it will break into small enough particles. We do see um, that these types are being referenced, referenced a lot more in applications and specifications these days. And, and then this follows, but we won't go into it, to it in a lot of depth, but the, the types. So one is type one is no passage of that, that sphere. Um, typically, you can think of that as a, as a filmed glass, a laminated glass, uh, or, or something like that, where the, the particles stay together. Type two would be essentially the break patterns and whatnot of tempered glass where the particles break, but they are, are thought to break um, in a safe manner. Type three, again, is typically how plastics break, and you do have to do the modules of elasticity and Rockwell hardness. And then type four is where it doesn't break, and as I said, you have to do the center punch fragmentation test if it is tempered glass. What has been removed uh, quickly is a discussion on dimensional tolerances. That was deemed to be a specification and not necessarily part of what was needed in this standard. There was a glass thickness table that was taken out. Uh, there's no designation of clear or translucent. That was in the previous standard, and that has been removed because they can reference um, these other documents. The flatness requirements have been pulled out, and you can see really the things that were related to specification of the standard or quality of the finalized product have been pulled out of the, of the newest version. In summary, it's a much broader applicability of the glazing types. Um, it, it covers a lot, lot more of the uh, glazing materials that are out there than it did previously. The impact test is virtually unchanged, so it will, will not cause a disruption. It is a little bit tighter in the interpretation of a pass-fail, but it, the testing itself does not change. Uh, the thermal tests for, um, are required based on the products, so not to discard or completely eliminate any product. There are two different types of thermal testing allowed, um, and the glazing types and retention specifications are in the typing, type one, type two, type three, type four. So those are given. Remember, we're changing from impact classes to category, and so that A and B is a big watch out um, when you see standards. The weathering requirements are included, specification details have been removed, and references standards and terminology have been added. So they did, in fact, harmonize very, very nicely with the Z97-2015, and in overall, the safety glazing standard has been significantly upgraded. So with that, I'll open up a few minutes of questions and, um, and see if there's anything I can answer for you. We're all on mute, right? <laughs> Um, they should all be open. Okay. All right. Did anybody have any questions, or was it was it so crystal clear that you 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 got it all down pat? All right. I'm not hearing any questions. I don't see any questions online. So with that, I will thank you for spending um, spending your lunch hour. And uh, should anything come up, should there be questions, please don't hesitate to to contact me, and um, I'll try to answer them or get you in touch with somebody that can. So. Thanks, Julia.
Thank you very much. Thank you, Julie. Have a great day, everyone. Okay. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye.